Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, the two big stories are inextricably entwined. Nuclear Energy Information Service, or NEIS, hosted a Nuclear Waste Strategy Summit in Chicago last weekend, bringing together activists from the United States, Canada, and several First Nations people. Unfortunately, the day before it began, the Illinois state legislature, in a truly boneheaded move, voted a bailout of the multi-billion dollar profit-making Exelon in order to keep running two aging nuclear facilities that Exelon itself has declared are not economically viable. Corporate welfare at its most blatant. So, as planned, this nuclear hot seat will be dedicated to input from those participants in the strategy summit with interviews that were conducted both before and after news hit of the Exelon bailout. You will find that the comments that the individuals make will be larded through with comments on and references to the mistake that Illinois made. Limited news this week to make room for the special report, but we will have numbnuts of the week for outstanding nuclear boneheadedness and more honest nuclear information than was discussed at the Illinois State House. Obviously. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, December 6, and here is the week's nuclear news from a different perspective. The Illinois legislature has passed a Commonwealth Edison, a.k.a. Exelon, rate hike to bail out nuclear power plants. This raises electricity rates on Illinois residents and businesses to bail out a pair of Exelon's nuclear power plants, which Exelon has already admitted are not economically viable. At the same time, many Illinois social service agencies have been teetering on the brink of financial collapse, and public universities are in bad shape for lack of money. Representative Sam Yingling, a Democrat, put it best when he said, What are you doing, guys? We are talking about a multi-billion dollar corporation bailout for one of the most profitable energy companies in the state. And how are we going to finance this? This is going to be financed on the back of the ratepayers. Much more about this bailout in our special report. And now, Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's of the week. The Ukrainian region of Polisia, 200 miles east of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster site, has become a boomtown for foragers seeking mushrooms and berries, nearly all of which are contaminated with radiation. Ukraine has become a berry exporter to the European Union, hauling 1,300 tons of fresh berries and over 17,000 tons of frozen berries to the European market in 2015. But of course, there could be some hidden costs. That's because European customers do not know they are ingesting food containing radioactive isotopes. And the berries can be labeled organic since radioactivity is not covered under common organic designations. The locals who are harvesting the berries are showing evidence of higher rates of certain birth defects and diseases. This is very, very bad. And that's why EU officials who do not reveal potential radioactivity contamination in organic berries, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of the week. And now our special featured report. Genuine experts on nuclear issues from around the United States, Canada, and several First Nations converged on Chicago for a National Radioactive Waste Strategy Summit last weekend. For three days, the agenda included radioactive waste creation, storage, treatment, and disposal, reactor decommissioning, effects of uranium mining on indigenous populations, national proposals for away from the reactor quote-unquote, centralized interim storage, otherwise known as out of sight, out of mind, and my fingers are really crossed on this one by the powers that be, 
That's where they want to stash the spent nuclear fuel. And there were discussions on small modular reactors. The day before the strategy summit began, I spoke with Dave Kraft, head of the Nuclear Energy Information Service and host of the event, as to the plans that were in place. Dave Kraft, thanks so much for taking this time to be with us when you have so much on your plate this weekend. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. NEIS has organized the Radioactive Waste Strategy Summit. What is this gathering and why do it now? Okay, a slight correction. Uh, yep. NEIS okay. is hosting it in Chicago, but we've been part of a planning team which has been meeting since late spring, roughly, to discuss setting up a strategic planning summit, a comprehensive summit on radioactive waste issues. We were finding that around the country, and even internationally, you include Canada and elsewhere, there are different components of the radioactive waste spectrum that are really hot items right now. And with the new administration coming in, we realized we really had to have our act together expecting federal legislation coming down the pike in 2017. So that was the push to organize the conference. And we have participants coming from all over the country, from several First Nations groups, from Canada, and we are going to be dealing with topics uh, ranging from high-level radioactive waste spent fuel all the way down to uranium mining on indigenous lands, environmental justice issues, transportation of waste, the shipping casks, the storage casks. The whole spectrum is going to be covered at this conference. What are you hoping will be the result of this gathering taking place? What do you hope will come out of it? Because it's a strategic planning summit and not a usual talking head kind of program, it's mostly going to be organizations stating where they are in terms of their particular needs, their particular issues, kind of weaving it all together at the end of three days into a strategic plan on how we're going to meet the challenges that the nuclear industry is going to throw at us in 2017. So that's the overall outcome is to come away with a unified uh, approach and action plan for 2017 on radioactive waste. One of the things that's notable about this meeting, at least from my perspective, is that media access has been constrained and recordings will not be allowed of the actual session. And I'm assuming that that extends to live streaming as well. You're correct. Why was that decision made? Because it's a planning conference. We're mapping out strategy. We certainly don't want to tip the hand you know, and we might as well put in full-page ads in the New York Times if we were going to do that. So this is a very uh, unique situation where it's planning. But we also knew that we would be assembling in one place some of the most important experts that we have on the radioactive waste issue. So what we did do is make interview opportunities available prior to the formal start of the conference and then after the, the conference officially ends on Sunday evening. So we did understand the need to have some of these individuals speak with media, we just didn't want to reveal anything strategic that could come back to haunt us in 2017. What has been the media response thus far? Are they jumping to the opportunity to do these interviews? Have you had a lot of contact? Actually not. We didn't put a lot of advance notice out to them. We did a typical media advisory announcing who would be here, what times it would be available. And we've had only one or two reporters respond so far. So it has not been a large response to it at this time. I should say, though, that in Illinois right now, the media here is focusing on the drama that's taking place in the state legislature, as we speak even, on whether or not Exelon Corporation will have three of its nuclear reactors bailed out by ratepayer subsidies or whether they're going to close those reactors. So that's kind of overshadowing pretty much everything. And where does that stand today? I know you said that there was going to be a hearing today in Springfield, Illinois, at the state legislature. That's correct. There was a hearing this morning in the Senate. As we're speaking, I was told that they are now debating it on the House floor. So we will know today because it's the final day of the veto session. They will not come back in session until January. So up until 12 midnight, anything can happen. Here's hoping that it goes the right way and that there's no bailout for the failing nuclear reactors. And at the same time, that as a result of this weekend, you end up with the strategies we as a community to help make a difference in getting these 
things shut down and have the waste handled in a responsible way for the future and future generations. Well, thank you for the well wishes. We hope the same thing, and we're here to work for you folks. NEIS Director Dave Kraft. He said anything can happen, and unfortunately it did, because only a few hours after we recorded our talk, that's when the Illinois legislature passed the corporate welfare bailout of Entergy's two nuclear reactors in Illinois, putting the weight entirely on the shoulders of the ratepayers. As you'll hear in many of the following interviews, this bad news had a deep impact on the proceedings. As one Strategy Summit participant told me, when I heard the news, it was like somebody punched me in the gut. But before this bad news hit, I was able to interview Karen Haddon of the Texas-based Sustainable Energy and Economic Development Coalition. Karen is a frequent nuclear hot seat source, and here she explains the issues surrounding the proposed high-level nuclear waste dump near Andrews, Texas. Hi, this is Karen Haddon. I'm the director of the SEED Coalition in Texas, the Sustainable Energy and Economic Development Coalition. We are a statewide organization, but we work with folks around the country, and we work to protect human health and the environment. And right now we're working a great deal on the radioactive waste issue because we are under assault. There is a plan underway to dump high-level radioactive waste. This is the irradiated fuel rods from nuclear reactors around the whole country and bring them to Texas and nearby New Mexico and dump them on us. These materials are incredibly dangerous to our health. If you were exposed to this without shielding, it would kill you in a heartbeat. You would be dead within a week at the longest. And many of the materials in lesser exposure cause cancer, uh, various different kinds and birth defects and genetic damage serious in terms of the materials that we are about to get dumped on our region. And they would go to communities that are not very able to fight back. In the Andrews County area, there are people in Andrews, Texas, and nearby, very, very close to the waste control specialist site, is Eunice, New Mexico, five miles away. These are largely Hispanic regions, and again, there's not a lot of wealth or organizing, and it's very, very difficult for these communities to fight back. They've been targeted for a long time already, and this is an ongoing assault. And what this means for the rest of the country is that this high-level waste would come on trains, most likely, also barges and some truck transport, and would be coming to various different major cities. Uh, that poses the risk of accidents and also terrorism activity. We don't like to think about it, but it's a reality in today's world that if there was an attack, it would probably be in a large city where it would have the most impact. Even our state environmental agency, the TCEQ, or Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, has warned about the aspect of terrorist activity, which is very unusual for them. They don't normally talk about these kind of things. And so we are very, very concerned about the impact that this could have on human health, that it could have on the environment if there was an accident or leak. And certainly everybody would be in a huge world of hurt if there was radiation exposure in a community or a large city because insurance, for one thing, would never pay for remediation. It just does not exist. So here at this conference that we're at, in Chicago this weekend, we're talking to people from around the whole country to say, this matters to all of you, in addition to being a huge environmental justice issue. We think that the safe thing to do is to keep the waste where it is right now, to continue it in secured storage. It's not a good solution ever, but it's less risky than putting this material on the highways and railways. Eventually, maybe we can actually find a scientifically valid repository, but that certainly has not been done yet. If we're going to ship waste, it certainly should be to that kind of facility, not taken out into the desert where the dry cast could just be exposed to the elements. 
they could just be cracked and destroyed. We have incredibly hot temperatures, very extreme. So it doesn't make sense to take it there, where it would most likely be left above ground, creating a disaster in terms of repackaging and dealing with this material later down the line. We should make sure that if and when these materials move, that it should be done safely. Karen Haddon of the Texas-based Seed Coalition. Traveling with Karen to the Strategy Summit was Alice Canestaro Garcia, a San Antonio-based activist who lives only five miles away from one of the major routes where the radioactive waste would be transported. Note that as Alice is talking, periodically you'll hear Karen Haddon jumping in. My name is Alice Canestero Garcia. I'm with a group, My Energy. In San Antonio, we call it Energia Mia. It's been in existence since 2009 as a response to the proposed expansion of the South Texas nuclear power plant. We did not want two more nuclear plants built, but it's going on to battle this proposed transport of irradiated nuclear material, which will go right through the heart of San Antonio if it's traveling either on the Union Pacific Railroad or on truck on State Highway 35. We in San Antonio believe that if people on the East Coast or around the country are making this radioactive waste, that they should keep it in hardened on-site storage. And I've just been looking at the maps of the Union Pacific Railroad and, uh, oh, my goodness, so many nuclear plants, especially on the East Coast, Central Florida. Not so much in the West, but having all of this high-level radioactive waste coming through our town and going on to the Texas proposed dump site of waste control specialist is horrifying. What do you hope to accomplish at the Strategy Summit? Environmental justice needs to clearly show people that if they are making this horrible stuff, that they should take responsibility of it where they are. It's highly unjust to send it to us. Do not dump on Texas. The big sure. issue has been the DOE, and they've been trying to say that we consent to having this waste. Ooh, so maybe you might have add, we add, to this? add, we do not consent or something. Who's saying we consented to this? We do not consent to taking anybody's nuclear waste. I want to tell you also in terms of background that we've had some luck with Senator Menendez in San Antonio. Hmm. He's very concerned about this issue and is willing to write an op-ed. And we've talked to a county commissioner, Tommy Calvert, who's very, very close with the military leaders in town. And there are so many military bases in San Antonio, and the trains go right next to them. And they are very concerned about security. That was Alice Canistaro Garcia, accompanied by Karen Hatton. By the way, we will be posting links to websites and or Facebook pages for all of the activists interviewed in this Nuclear Waste Strategy Summit report. The information will be up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 285. Leona Morgan of Diné No Nukes spoke of the negative legacy left by uranium mining and downwinder contamination on the Navajo people and the land. I'm speaking with Leona Morgan of Diné No Nukes. Leona, what are the issues that brought you to the summit that has just concluded in Chicago, and what were you hoping to learn or accomplish while you were there? Hi, Libby. The issues I work on at home are dealing with uranium mining. I live in Albuquerque, but most of my family and relatives are on the Navajo Nation where there has been a lot of uranium mining in the past and we're still dealing with cleanup issues. One of the biggest concerns that we have now on the western side of the Navajo Nation is the threat of transport of uranium ore coming from the Canyon Mine, which is a uranium mine near the Grand Canyon. The company is telling us that they have reached the depths of where the uranium ore is in the earth and that they're getting ready to extract it and they're planning to transport that ore to its White Mesa mill. So it's the same company, Energy Fuels, that owns the mine 
and the mill that is in southeast Utah. The issue that I'm looking at is the transportation issues of ore going through several communities, not just the Navajo Nation. It'll go through various Native communities as well as the state of Arizona and parts of Utah. And this company also owns a uranium mine on the New Mexico side. The New Mexico mine is called Roca Honda. And so if they are able to transport ore from Grand Canyon to the White Mesa Mill, this is something that we really want to stop. And I think it's very similar to the threat of transporting high-level radioactive waste from all over the country to places like Yucca Mountain or possibly southeastern New Mexico and Texas. The summit here in Chicago, the high-level radioactive waste summit, was very useful because these issues of transport are very similar. Even though they're not the same, it's important to spread awareness to the other people fighting different parts of the nuclear fuel chain. What I hoped to accomplish was basically to get support and be in solidarity with the folks fighting these issues either in reactor communities or threatened communities where the government is proposing to either open an interim storage, a permanent waste repository, and all of our issues are the same in that we know these are not real solutions and we do not want high level or uranium ore or any kind of radioactive materials going all over the country, either on the highway, on barges, or on the train. These are very dangerous substances, which if exposed to the environment or to the human population could result in health effects and then very dirty contamination that will last for a very long time. Virtually forever when one considers the lifespan of a human being. And of course, any form of transport has its vulnerabilities, be it trucks on a highway or a train. We've certainly seen train derailments. So all of that is dangerous. As a result of being at the summit, do you feel like you are in a stronger position to continue on with the work that you're doing? Yes. The short answer is yes. And myself and others, we all came together, and many of us work in isolation. So being at these summits, conferences, retreats, you know, it's a good time for us to rejuvenate, have a solidarity between each other, and support each other. And I think I'm speaking for myself, but I know a lot of the other attendees are leaving knowing they are not alone and knowing they have people to work with, people who they can count on. And basically, we all agreed to have continued dialogue on the issues and also to work together. It's not like we're just meeting one time and we're not going to see each other for a few years. This is really a place where people are coming together with the purpose of working together. What I came here to do was to continue to emphasize the need to include people fighting uranium mining, which is the front end of the nuclear fuel chain. And then something else I came here to do was to help to spread awareness about other issues that should be considered as part of our work. If we're going to fight these big monsters, we have to consider all of the issues that are affecting our communities out there, coming from the capitalist infrastructure of the United States, the various forms of racism and oppression that affect communities that are being threatened. And as an indigenous person, you know, it's always important for us to remind others about the uniqueness of our issues, not just as people of color, but as being some of the first oppressed people in this country from the very beginning and how that impacts not just our lives today, but our future generations and, of course, our culture. And so I did talk a little bit about sacred sites, and at the summit, I was able to help by organizing a panel on environmental justice. And so we heard from speakers, not just from uranium mining affected areas, but people dealing with weapons testing in Nevada and the Marshall Islands, and then people being affected with long-term possible waste storage at Yucca Mountain. And so hearing these stories from a cultural perspective 
was one of the biggest goals that I had to help to organize this panel so that people can leave here knowing a little bit more about the other impacts that maybe are not always discussed at these conferences. If people wish to learn more about the work of Dinesh No Nukes or about any of these issues, where can they go? We have a website. It is dinehnonukes.org, B-I-N-E-N-O-N-U-K-E-S.org, or you can check out Dine No Nukes' project, which is a collaboration called the Radiation Monitoring Project. Our website is radmonitoring.org. Thank you so much for the work you did at this conference and for the work that you are continuing to do as an important part of this community. Thanks. Leona Morgan of Dine No Nukes. Kevin Camps serves as radioactive waste watchdog for Beyond Nuclear, and his knowledge of rad waste issues, as well as his ability to clearly communicate them, is near legendary in our movement. I caught up with Kevin after the Strategy Summit as he was on his way to another energy demonstration. I'm talking with Kevin Camps, who is the radioactive waste specialist for Beyond Nuclear. Kevin, with radioactive waste being your bailiwick, what were some of the areas that were covered during the strategy session, and what were some important steps that you can talk about that came out of it? Well, you know, we have been planning to get together on a national level for many months, and the election results were kind of surprising, to put it mildly. And we really didn't expect to have to be talking about Yucca Mountain, for one thing, because it was canceled, has been, for about six years, has not received funding. The danger that we face with Yucca Mountain now is that with Republicans in control of the White House and both houses of Congress, there are especially House Republicans who want the Yucca Dump. They've wanted it for decades. And so they wouldn't have a problem with spending even tens of billions of public dollars to revive the Yucca Mountain Dump, to get it back to where it was seven years ago, proceed with the licensing process, and try to get their dump out there. We knew we were going to face parking lot dumps because that is Obama's brainchild. The Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future put a priority on opening parking lot dumps. The top targets are in West Texas and southeastern New Mexico, very close together, actually, within tens of miles of each other. But also on that target list would include Native American reservations and even nuclear power plant sites. So we had a lot to talk about, and we realized that we are entering a very dangerous time, and we're going to have a lot of work on our hands to try to stop all these bad ideas. Was there any specific issue or step forward that you can talk about that stands out for you that perhaps would not have happened without this gathering? Yeah, and it was very intentional, too. It was to get the reactor community together with the targeted dump site. So, you know, you've got groups like Citizens Awareness Network of New England who know better than anybody how dangerous high-level radioactive waste is because they've lived next to it. They've lived in the shadows of the atomic reactors for decades. They know what could happen, and they are not willing to offload their problem onto low-income people of color communities. That is what these parking lot dumps are all about, you know, in West Texas and Southeast New Mexico. That is predominantly Latin American communities, low-income communities. I mentioned the Native American reservations that are also being targeted. And so groups like Citizens Awareness Network really are a moral model because they know how dangerous it is. They live next to it, but they lead the campaigns to stop these dumps. We had a lot of discussions along those lines. And what do the reactor communities ask for in return? They ask for help in safeguarding the waste where it is in their communities through things like hardened on-site storage and upgrades to dry cask storage because current dry casks are so inadequate right now. A lot of really heart-rending stories were told in Chicago about the health impacts in places like New England just from the radiation releases from operating the reactors 
And one of our featured speakers was Dr. Gordon Thompson from Boston, who talked about the dangers of pool fires. We're talking mega catastrophes that could unfold out of these storage pools if they lose their cooling water supply. And so we all realized we got to get these pools emptied. We've been calling for that for a long time. But we have to secure the dry casks in hardened storage to prevent terrorist attacks on the dry casks and even leaks just from age-related degradation over long enough periods of time. So we covered a lot of ground, and we've got a lot of homework to do once we get back home after Chicago. What's next for you? Well, I am currently traveling with Joe Kennedy and Ian Zabardi of the Western Shoshone Nation up to the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation. Mm -hmm. We had planned the trip before the announcement by Obama's Army Corps of Engineers to deny the easement across the Missouri River or under the Missouri River for the pipeline. That is the plan, is to get up there, uh, groups like Indigenous Environmental Network and Honor the Earth who are on the front lines at Standing Rock, our longtime allies in fighting these parking lot dumps targeted at Native American lands. And so when they put out the SOS call in the summer for folks to get up to Standing Rock, we've tried to be there for them as much as possible because they've always been there for us in fighting parking lot dumps and mobile Chernobyl. So it's just an important, significant act of solidarity right now to stand with Standing Rock. Couldn't agree with you more on that one. Wish I could be there with you. Any final thought you would like to share with us? Just to get back to Standing Rock, I mean, it is good news for the moment, but remember, President Trump may have some other ideas, so we just have to keep doing all we can. And one of those campaigns is the divestment from the banks that are funding the Dakota Access Pipeline. And again, you know, these circles of solidarity are interesting because you've got people like Susan Sarandon, who is a Beyond Nuclear launch partner, who has really uh, taken a step up and leading that call for divestment from various major banks who are investors in Dakota Access Pipeline. So I think the Standing Rock Sioux have called for a month of action against the pipeline, and we just can't let up. I think folks need to continue to protest and divest at the banks and just uh, seal this victory so that the new Trump administration can't reverse it. From your mouth to somebody's ears. And it goes without saying, we're going to have to um, redouble our efforts on the radioactive waste front to prevent parking lot dumps that are environmentally racist and to prevent the mobile Chernobyls that would pass through most states to take the waste to these places. The uh, Yucca Mountain fight is decades old, and we're going to have to keep on fighting to prevent them from reviving that terrible scheme. Let's all just get ourselves together into one unified network of people fighting on behalf of the planet because that does appear to be what's happening. Yeah, these battlefronts are just different facets of the same fight against dirty, dangerous, and expensive energy technologies. That was Kevin Camps, radioactive waste watchdog, some would say bulldog, for Beyond Nuclear. Traveling with Kevin to Standing Rock and the No Dakota Access Pipeline Peaceful Defense of Our Water was Ian Zabarte of the Native Community Action Council. Ian had a lot to say about the anticipated push by our new federal administration to reopen Yucca Mountain as a high-level nuclear waste dump. My name is Ian Zabarte. I'm the Secretary of the Native Community Action Council which is a nonprofit organization representing Western Shoshone and Southern Paiute people of the Great Basin. We are a party withstanding in the Atomic Safety Licensing Board of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission licensing of the proposed high-level nuclear waste repository at Yucca Mountain. Our involvement as the Native Community Action Council initially was created by the Western Shoshone Nation out of a need to investigate the adverse health consequences experienced by the Western Shoshone and Southern Paiute people known to be plausible from exposure to radiation in fallout from the testing of weapons of mass destruction by the United States and the United Kingdom. And what states are we talking about here? What is the area? For the purposes of our discussion, Yucca Mountain is wholly within the exterior boundaries of the 1863 Treaty of Ruby Valley. No portion of our country uh, is included in the boundaries of the United States because we have a treaty which is in full force and effect. And that is 
the primary contention that we produce for the Atomic Safety Licensing Board, that the Department of Energy cannot prove ownership. Additionally, we did research in the 1990s on the adverse health consequences from the radiation, and we found that our exposure based on lifestyle differences, which is diet, what we ate, how we prepared our food, mobility, where we went, what we did there, and shelter, what our houses were made of and where they were located. Based on those lifestyle differences alone, we had a significant increase in adverse health consequences, cancers, uh, birth defects, and other types of illnesses uh, known to be plausible from exposure to radiation. So that's how we began, and we used that research as the basis for our contentions in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission beginning in 2008 which is the reason why we believe and we're confident is the basis for the United States Department of Energy's withdrawal of the license application at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for the Yucca Mountain proposed repository. Where does it stand now, and what actions are the Western Shoshone people through the Native Community Action Council planning to take as a result of the work that you were able to do at the strategy session this past weekend? We had a good discussion with a lot of the stakeholder groups from nuclear reactor communities as well as potential disposal sites that are being proposed or volunteered by various states and communities that really think that hosting such a proposed repository or a consolidated storage site for high-level nuclear waste is a good thing. But what we were doing there was trying to communicate to those other communities, either disposal sites, that they're not alone or the reactor communities that we understand and we need to work together to end the threat. You know, when your bathtub's filling up, the first thing you do is turn off the water. And in this case, the reactors are not shutting down. Well, some are shutting down, but they're continuing to run and exacerbate the problem. And the technical issues associated with running these reactors longer and making the fuel even hotter is going to cause serious problems. And so when we're talking with the other communities, other stakeholder communities, We're trying to communicate to them that their waste just being sent away, just just getting rid of it from their community, is not a very responsible way to treat other people. And that if their waste comes to our country from every site, for example, there's 115 reactors in 75 sites in 30 different states. And each of those communities bear the burden of risk for the waste at their site. However, from our perspective, if we are the site or some other community is the site for the final resting place for high-level nuclear waste, those communities will bear the burden of risk from every site. Those waste streams will combine to become a river as they approach our country if we're the site, and we would be forced to bear the burden of risk of every reactor site's waste, and that is a disproportionate burden of risk, and we call that environmental racism. I've been involved in this for 30 years now, and my original involvement was because of my family members that had been killed from the radiation. I have at least a handful that I can identify. And so I got involved, and I've done this for 30 years now. I think I have another 30 years to do this, and that'll be a total of 60 years. I'll be maybe 80. (laughs) But that's what it takes, a commitment. And I can do this. We are doing this. We're doing it for humanity. And if people want more information, they can look at Native Community Action Council altogether dot org. That was Ian Zabarte of the Native Community Action Council representing the Western Shoshone and Southern Paiute people. Ian has two websites, one of which is too complex to try and give you over the air. So just go to the website, nuclearhotseat.com under this episode number 285, and that's where you'll find the link. Susan Corbett is based in South Carolina, where she works with the Sierra Club Nuclear Free Campaign. She not only talked about the radioactive waste problems she was in Chicago to discuss, but some surprising, if not shocking, revelations regarding nuclear issues within the Sierra Club, especially important in light of the fact that the Sierra Club signed off on the Illinois Agreement. I'm talking with Susan Corbett, who is with the Sierra Club's Nuclear Free Campaign. Susan, 
tell us about this group, this campaign that you've got going, who's in it, and the kind of work you've been doing. Actually, it's kind of odd because most people don't know this because it's not widely publicized. The Sierra Club has opposed nuclear power going back into the 70s. They have longstanding policy against building more nukes. They have longstanding policy against using plutonium as a fuel and longstanding policy against consolidated interim storage. But unfortunately, for a variety of different reasons, the club has never focused on nuclear power as one of its big campaigns. And we think that's a really, really big problem. So about six years ago, a group of us got together and formed the Nuclear Free Campaign, and we have been struggling mightily to bring the club to put its resources in some small way toward dealing with the issues of nuclear waste. While I will, I think we made a little headway, it certainly is not enough. We're still a campaign with a little C, which means we're not funded. We get no money except for small grants that we write. And we're constantly going around begging for help here and there and often shut out of many processes that we believe we should be a part of. And we're not consulted on nuclear issues and we have lots of complaints. That said, there is a tremendous amount of clout in having the Sierra Club name, so we stick in there, hang in there, because we feel that if we could ever get this giant to turn its attention to nuclear issues, it would make a huge difference and be very important. So we are slowly trying to turn the Titanic to where its its focus is back on track on nuclear issues as well, because nuclear is 20% of the national energy source, and how can you have a, a national clean energy campaign and not talk about what to do with nuclear power. One of the things that I've always been impressed about about this campaign, and no, until just now, I did not know that you got no funding from the Sierra Club, which is ridiculous. Some of the most effective people within the anti-nuclear movement who I've had dealings with and done interviews with through the years are part of this group. Would you just let people know some of the individuals who do work with you under the Sierra Club umbrella? Well, there's a, right now it's a 13 or 14 member team. It's gone up and down. And if I forget somebody, please forgive me. But out, starting out in California, you have two amazing ladies that have worked really hard on San Onofre and Diablo Canyon. That's Donna Gilmore and, and Linda Seeley. And, and up in Oregon, now I think she's just moved to Louisiana, was Leslie March, who's been a big activist for many, many years on this. And then we have Sarah Fields out in Utah, and Sarah is one of the most amazingly knowledgeable people on uranium mining. And it's something that we're very upset that the club is not spending more time on because you talk about an environmental justice issue. The Native peoples, in fact, at this summit we were just at, we had Navajo and Western Shoshone people there talking about the devastation of their lands from uranium mining. So we want more emphasis placed on that. We have Wally Taylor. He's an envi- he's the chair of the Iowa chapter, an environmental lawyer. We have three people from Tennessee, Stephen Sondheim, Donnie Safer, Linda Modica. We have Becky Rafter, who is the head of director of WAND in Atlanta, Women's Action for New Directions. Diane DeRiga, Washington, D.C. She also works for NEARS. We have Linda Lewison up in Chicago. She works with Dave Kraft at NEIS. Mark Muick, who's up in uh, Michigan, he's the newest member of the team. He's the chair of the nuclear team up in Michigan at the Sierra Club up there. Who am I forgetting? Me and Pat Morida in Ohio. Pat's been a longtime activist in Ohio. She's chair of the nuclear issues there. And, and Erica Gray in Virginia, who is this amazing resource and does so much while working a full-time job and raising children. So we are a bunch of just really, really determined and persistent activists who constantly make life miserable for this national board because we won't be quiet and we won't go away, and we're all constantly raising hell about what the club should be doing more to fight nukes. If people want to join with you, either members of the Sierra Club already who want to make your voice known at a higher level or at a louder level, or people who are local in any of these communities that you have mentioned who would like to join with this fight against nuclear under the umbrella of the Sierra Club, what's the best step for them to take? First thing, definitely contact us. I mean, you, we have a Facebook page. You can find us, Nuclear Free Campaign Facebook page, and you should be able to post something there, send us a message. We'll call you, but, if, for example, if you live in a, if you have a state chapter, then one of the things you should do is start pushing that state chapter to deal with whatever uh, nuclear issue you have in your state. And if you don't get any satisfaction there, call us, because we will try to help you get resources to work on this stuff. And the other thing that we need everybody to do is call the national organization. Call the board, call the president, Aaron Mayer, call Michael Brune, tweet him, you send him a, you know, a tweet. 
and ask the club, when are they going to start working on nuclear issues, that they have to need to fund this campaign? Because what happened in Chicago, what just happened in Chicago, is a terrible harbinger of what is likely to now happen. Now that the utilities see that we can be bought, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to just drag out these old nuclear plants for the next decade using ratepayer and taxpayer money to prop them up and dragging their heels on renewables and clean energy. We have done a dangerous disservice to clean energy deployment in this country, and we don't want to let this happen again. So we need for people to let the club know that they're unhappy, that the club is not putting resources into fighting nuclear, along with fighting coal and fracking. We know we can't shut them all down, but by golly, we don't have to prolong their lives. That $2.3 billion that is going to be used to prop up these two nuclear plants and keep them open after they were supposed to be shut down, imagine the work that could be done with that money in getting solar panels for people's houses, energy efficiency programs. You're throwing away these tremendous resources on a dying, dead, dirty, dangerous, expensive energy source that has no future and depriving the energy sources that do have a future of a much-needed source of money. The club cannot talk with forked tongue. They cannot say that they are for clean energy while allowing dirty nuclear to be subsidized. They cannot say that they are for environmental justice when they are letting these nuclear power plants drive up poor people's electric rates to the point where they have to decide whether they're going to keep the lights on or pay their rent. And every bit of that nuclear waste is going to end up in some person of color's backyard. I promise you, that's where all the dumps are, and that's where it's all going to go. So these are economic and environmental justice issues associated with nuclear power that the club cannot claim to be concerned about those and not speak up about how nuclear infects all of those with its it taints and, and it poisons, all of these things that we're trying to do, every aspect of nuclear chain from beginning to end. Once again, if people want to contact you and strategize actions, be it in their state or with the national office, where can they go? Is the Facebook page the only place? Right now, you can find me on Facebook, Susan Corbett. I have a pretty robust site. I'm always bringing in new folks, and I'm happy to talk to people or private message people and try to direct them where they should go. Find me or look at the Nuclear Free Campaign. Find someone on there. Uh, our website is not very good right now. We're still working to improve that. National has allowed us to have a small website, but they don't give us anybody to help maintain it. So we are a completely volunteer-driven uh, campaign with a little C. So uh, we're doing the best we can. But you can find me. I'm easy to find. You can go to the South Carolina Chapter website, and I'm the energy chair, so my email's on there and my phone number, so you can call me from that, too. This may be a small group, but you are mighty in your power and your impact. <laughs> that was Susan Corbett of the Sierra Club Nuclear Free Campaign. If you are a Sierra Club member or considering joining, now would be a great time to call email, or write, oh, heck, do all three. But get to their national office and ask them to add a focus on nuclear issues for all the reasons Susan Corbett just enumerated. Finally, I spoke earlier today with Donna Gilmore of SanOnofreSafety.org. She's an expert on dry cask storage and what's wrong with the inferior whole tech models that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has approved for use in the United States. What I got, however, was Donna's powerful feedback on Illinois' Exelon bailout. I'm Donna Gilmore, uh, Santa No Free Safety. I was in Chicago when the announcement was made that the governor is planning to side this Illinois bailout bill to keep total nuclear reactors running in spite of the fact they can't even be adequately inspected or maintained. The headline should be for everyone that the Illinois Governor Rauner is forcing ratepayers to pay to expose their own children to more lethal radiation for another 10 years. This is a genocide situation we're, we're actually in. The environmental groups that sign on to this, you know, this should not be a Sophie's choice between some short-term renewables versus these aging nuclear plants. It can't be adequately inspected, monitored, repaired. They release radiation into the air, water, and ground, even without a meltdown. They have to do it just to operate. 
do these people know about the increased rate of childhood leukemia for children exposed to radiation from operating nuclear reactors? There's enough peer-reviewed studies on that, so this is not an opinion. This is a fact. Or do they know about the dangers to the immune system, the heart, and other vital organs? These radionuclides, are, they're like bullets. They damage the DNA, and they damage anything else that they penetrate. Do they know about the existing Chernobyl waste canisters that have been loaded in Illinois starting in 2000, and that they have no way to inspect even the outside of these, and that they could start leaking lethal radionuclides at any time? Do they know about this? Do they know Exelon has no adequate plan in place to stop these leaks once they start, and they have no way to repair even partial cracks, even if they could find the cracks? This is unconscionable. This is unconscionable. You know, I urge people, take your children, go to, they're going to Clinton. The governor's going to Clinton tomorrow. And when you say Clinton, you mean Clinton, Illinois, not to... Yeah, the plants they want to shut down is at, at Clinton, Illinois. I mean, it is so hard. It is so difficult to shut down these old degrading new plants. And the the governor and the legislature in Illinois had an opportunity to shut them down, and instead they choose to poison their own citizens with this lethal radiation. You know, I recommend that mothers take their kids down, get them a big sign, put a big nuclear radiation symbol on it, put your child's face in the center of that symbol, and march at the governor's house, march at the Capitol, march in Clinton. People need to know, the media needs to report that the governor is intentionally poisoning our children, and this should have consequences and should be stopped. They're going to be doing the same thing with the other states, and we don't we don't need these nuclear plants at all. The propaganda is ridiculous. Why should we be paying millions and billions of dollars to Exelon, who is continuing to make profits? The social services in Illinois are at risk from that governor. So in addition to the reduced social services, now they're going to raise their rates so they can give Exelon stockholders more money? Is this our future? You know, if people don't get up and get involved, this is going to continue. And if people want to know more about the issue of the radiation dangers, they can go to SantaNotreSafety.org. Donna Gilmore. There are several other interviews recorded that there's no time for this week, so we'll try to get to them in the coming weeks. And, of course, there is much more to discuss about the Exelon bailout and the terrible precedent that it sets. But know that, as Dave Kraft said in that first audio clip, these activists who came great distances to Chicago, many of them at their own expense, did so in order to, as Dave put it, work for you. The opportunity now exists for you to join with them as they implement the strategies that were discovered, uncovered, and developed, and become an active part of the anti-nuclear movement if you aren't there already. Remember that links to the activists and their organizations will be up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 285. So please, explore the opportunities, and if you haven't yet, Get involved. A reminder that Nuclear Hot Seat relies on your donations to keep bringing you the nuclear news that you won't hear anywhere else. You may ask yourself, why is this important? I'll let the Sierra Club's Susan Corbett tell you in this brief clip taken from an exchange we had at the very end of our interview. And thank you for the work that you do. I follow you, and I know a lot of people look up to you and and are very appreciative of how you're getting the word out and and bringing all these things to the public and helping educate. That's part of the whole problem is people are just not educated. And the industry is doing a snow job trying to tell us how wonderful this thing is. And they've been able to brainwash amazing people like Jim Hansen, who are going around the country saying nuclear is the only solution, and it's so wrong. So education, things that you're you're doing is so important in helping to get the word out about why nuclear is such a bad idea. Thanks, Susan. You know, Nuclear Hot Seat does take a lot of time, energy, and, yes, money to stay up and running every week, 52 weeks a year. 
I couldn't do it without your support. So please help me keep getting the information out and educating people so that you know what's really going on in the nuclear world. Consider it your holiday gift towards a nuclear-free future. Guaranteed good karma. To donate, just go to NuclearHotSeat.com, click on the big red Donate button, and know that we are grateful for anything that you can contribute. No donation too small, no donation too large. So please do what you can today. If you prefer to send a check, send me an email at info at nuclearhotseat.com for a snail mail address. And even if you can't contribute financially, I could always use an add a girl or two because support comes in a lot of different forms and every kind is always appreciated. Here's today's final thought. I trust that all the activists from the Strategy Summit are now home or at their chosen destination, hopefully caught up on sleep and, in the case of those who went to Standing Rock, staying warm and safe. At times like this, it strikes me that we are so few, and yet look at who we are. Look how good we are. And think of what we have accomplished and can accomplish with so few resources. This strategy summit and the timing of the Exelon bailout insanity seems to me an historic turning point in our movement. As the communities from all the various aspects of the nuclear radioactive waste cycle came together to plan, coordinate, and take action, we were making connections that will last the rest of our lives and joining in a larger movement that is taking place around the world based on environmental issues indigenous peoples, social justice, speaking truth to power, which never wants to hear inconvenient truths. As we say in the beginning of the show, the activists are linking. Or to think of it another way, as mentioned in many Native traditions, Grandmother Spider wove the web of the world. And as we lean on the Internet to do our work, the World Wide Web, now reduced to those three W's, each of us is a strand in making what is broken whole again. Or if you prefer a Judeo-Christian reference, we are indeed David versus Goliath, fighting for the future of people and the environment. But I know that when it came to David and Goliath, David won. And you know something? So will we. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, December 6, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from CNBC, the Chicago Tribune, and NEIS. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. If you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. If you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. A reminder that if you appreciate weekly verifiable news updates about nuclear issues around the world, delivered with as much humor as possible, take a moment in honor of the holidays whichever holidays you support, and send a supporting donation to NuclearHotSeat.com. This is Libby Halevi of Heart History Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. So do not go back to sleep, because truly, we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? New Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb.